Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this discussion meeting on the synergies and trade-offs between sustainable development and climate action. This is the first event in the IES's stages on the road to COP26. The IES will be focusing acti its activities in the run-up to COP26 around six key themes, the first of which is sustainability. Within these themes, a key ambition for the IES is to collaborate with our members, other professional bodies and environmental scientists from across the sector to shape the discussion over the next year in recognition that collaboration is absolutely key. The importance of the scientific and professional community coming together with a shared vision and collective voice for how we should tackle the climate crisis is essential for success. You can read more about um, our plans and the one up to COP in the link that I'm just gonna post um, in the chat box. So that should be coming up for you now. Um, to steer our activities in this area, we have established a COP26 community, um, a group of members with the expertise related to COP26 and who will lead on our activities moving forward. On the next slide, you can see the agenda for today. Um, but just before we get going, I just wanted to go a few, through a few housekeeping things. Please do turn off your camera and mute yourself during the presentation. This helps to limit distractions. Um, you will, of course, be able to turn these back on uh, during the Q&A and the breakout discussions later on. Um, after our speaker's presentation, um, which is going to be recorded, um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and these questions can be put in the chat box. I will now hand over to Professor David Viner, a member of the COP26 community, who will be sharing this event, chairing this event. David um, has had a career of over 27 years that spans academia, the public sector and business. He has worked extensively at the interface between science policy and commercial communities. And David currently works at the Green Investment Group where he heads up the Green Transition Team and holds a visiting professorship at the University of East Anglia. David is also currently a coordinating lead author for Working Group 2 of the IPCC and was a lead author for the IPCC's Special Report on Climate Change and Land. David also sits on the National Environmental Research Council's Scientific Committee and is on the review panel for the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. David, over to you. Ethne, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and many thanks for joining. Um, I hope in these challenging times we're all safe and well. It's been a um, yeah, it's been a struggle at times to uh, to keep working and keep focused uh, during the lockdown downs. Um, but I, I sincerely hope you're, you're all managing. Um, and I hope you find this event informative and useful uh, as we move forward to COP26 in Glasgow. And the world in general heads towards the transition with many countries now rearranging their policies, transforming their policies to align with the Paris Agreement, the agreement they signed up to. The, I'd first of all like to introduce Professor Chris Rapley. Um, Chris is, well, I've known Chris for nearly 30 years um, and he's been inspirational to myself but many other people as well. Chris is currently a professor of climate science at the University College London, a fellow of UCL and of St Edmunds College in Cambridge. He's a member of Academia Europe, chair of the European Science Foundation's European Space Sciences Committee, member of the advisory group board of the UK government's Green Clean Growth Fund, patron of Surrey's Climate Commission, and a member of the UK Science Museum's Group Science Advisory Board. He's also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Scientists Warning and a member of the UK Parliamentary and Scientific Committee. More recently, Chris has, well, yeah, over his, in his career, Chris has you know, just been so extensively involved in, in the climate change issue. Um, he's been a chairman of the London Climate Change Partnership. He's held a whole series of positions which has helped influence and move forward the climate change discussion and action across a whole series of, series of forums and influence a great deal of people. Um, he's also been a playwright. He, in 2014, Chris and playwright Duncan Macmillan wrote the acclaimed play 2071, which was performed at the Royal Court Theatre and in Hamburg and Brussels. And Chris has been scientific consultant to the BBC One's Climate Change, The Facts, which was presented by Sir David Attenborough. So really is a great honour to have Chris here. Um, great to listen to him and hopefully, well, I'm sure that Chris will set, in, set the scene here for helping to stimulate the debate and also, you know, help focus IES, Institute of Environmental Sciences, on its, on its, on its road to, to COP26 and help galvanise the wider community into action. So Chris, <coughs> over to you. Thank you very much. 
Thanks very much for the introduction, David. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm putting up my slides. I hope you can see that. Can somebody just confirm that? Yeah, that looks all good. Thank you, Chris. OK, thanks, Ethne. Well, uh, so let's uh, let's press on with uh, this little introductory talk, which I hope will will stimulate the uh, discussion for the rest of the morning. And uh, I've called it Finding Our Balance and uh, found this rather nice slide of the uh, the uh, sustainable development goals uh, projected onto the, the UN building in, in New York. Um, so I thought I'd just start with something that we're all kind of experiencing, something very familiar, just to make a, a, a very straightforward point. Um, we all remember um, a little while ago uh, the, the Chancellor uh, deciding that to bail out um, a, a, a very significant uh, part of the UK uh, economy, the, the world of restaurants and eateries, um, he came up with this Eat Out to Help Out scheme. And, and just recently, um, looking back on this, uh, he's, he's been criticised. Throughout the summer, epidemiologists warned of the threat of a second wave, uh, but on the 24th of September, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, what, what was going on here? Well, he, he was attempting to balance the economy. Um, and uh, we all know how people have been suffering under COVID um, uh, with the... Um, it's interesting, I can't see part of my slide, but never mind. Um, but with with public health. Um, and, and of course, in this case, uh, it, the, the two did not jive in a in a cooperative way. He had to make some very hard choices. Um, and, and that just underscores um, the same happened to Churchill in, in World War Two, uh, bombing of Coventry and so on. Um, and it just underscores that political decision making or decision making in general uh, can sometimes uh, allow one to get two goals uh, coherent and uh, and address them simultaneously. But often there are some extremely hard choices to take. Um, and of course, other decisions made about COVID had a third factor involved, and that was uh, peace, people's personal lives, their ability to meet their families. Um, and so other trade-offs were made, uh, and, and again, trading off human mortality um, against other things in ways that uh, people will be no doubt criticised for um, equally. So that was in a situation where the evidence was pretty clear. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if you allowed people to mix together uh, when there was an infectious disease about, it was quite likely that there would be some perverse and negative consequences. Um, but I was really impressed years and years and years ago coming across a paper um, by uh, this guy Jay Forrester from Columbia University. This is in the late 1970s. I came across the paper, but it was published in the 70s. And he said that, you know, uh, it's not just that we can get into trouble um, making decisions where we know what the consequences are, but we have to make hard decisions anyway. Um, uh, but of course, uh, sometimes we may not have the information at hand, so that's another reason why things may go wrong. But there's a deeper issue. And he says the human mind is not adapted to interpreting how social systems behave. Social systems belong to a class called multi-loop nonlinear feedback systems. So they're, they're, it's an intricate web of interconnections. So you, you, you intervene, you do something, uh, and the consequences ripple through the system in ways that are extremely difficult for the human mind to figure out. And he makes the point, in the long history of evolution, it's not been necessary until very recent historical times for people to understand complex feedback systems. Evolutionary processes have not given us the mental ability to interpret properly the dynamic behaviour of those complex systems in which we are now embedded. And you see it, we, we tend to think uh, no doubt, as our um, hunter-gatherer forebears did, in terms of cause and effect. You know, you kick a ball and it moves. If the ball moves, it must have been kicked. There must have been some impact on it. Um, but multi-loop nonlinear feedback systems aren't like that. You, you do something and something totally counterintuitive pops up somewhere else. And it's a struggle to understand all the links and interconnections that explain why that happened. 
Now, Forrester's point was that the advent of digital computers, which, um, oh yes, and his point is that, that attractive policies, things that look sensible, can create disasters. His point was that the age of digital computing allowed such systems to be modelled, not perfectly, um, but those models are a tool that allow uh, deeper insights to be generated about the, what the consequences are. The point here is that you need a tool to try and help you understand these interactions. This was the model in that same paper that he produced of the Earth system. I mean, it's a very rudimentary, you know, one of the original ones. Um, but it was the basis for the uh, Club of Rome report, The Limits to Growth. Um, and of course, the just like Malthusian theory and so on, there were those who reacted very strongly, said this is all doom and gloom because the predictions were fairly gloomy. Um, but 30 years on and subsequently, uh, even that relatively crude tool has proved to be a pretty good guide to many of the things that have actually transpired as a result. So his point was made that although the human mind is very poor at understanding how these systems work and how these interactions take place, it's smart enough to create tools that allow us some useful traction and some useful insight. Well, David said, I, I, I've been involved in the climate change story since the 1980s, so it's been a frustrating journey. Um, but in 2015, we had this diplomatic triumph where the nations of the world decided <clears throat> not that um, it, it, to argue about whether or not climate change was real and whether or not something should be done about it, uh, but they agreed that something should be done about it. And so the, uh, there was a, a fundamental shift, a quantum shift in the discussion from should we to what? What are we going to do? Uh, and of course, they offered um, a set of goals uh, to hold temperatures well below two degrees and if possible to keep at one and a half degrees. <clears throat> but they also came forward with a collective plan uh, a, a set of uh, nationally determined contributions uh, to cut anth anthropogenic emissions and to achieve a balance with removals by sinks in the second half of the 21st century. The only problem was that the NDCs, uh, of, of which um, there are 164 in total, if you, if you look around the various nations' commitments, and within those 7,000 actions, um, they're not sufficient to keep us uh, to that two degree goal. I've, I've shown this limit here with these red bars. Now, things have improved a little in, in the recent year. Uh, previously, the commitments made at uh, Paris were only going to get us to around three and a half degrees of warming uh, by 2100, rather than within the two degree to one and a half degree band. Um, but some new commitments, especially by China, uh, and of course, with the Biden administration bringing America back into the fold, we can hope for some some further um, uh, ambitious advances. Um, nevertheless, we're getting down to the point where uh, it, it's within our grasp uh, to achieve that two, deg two degree goal, uh, provided we move swiftly and with determination and, and scale up the pace and scope of, of, of what's going on. But the point about this slide is really to introduce the idea of limits. So this, this was picked up by uh, a bunch of uh, scientific thinkers uh, maybe five or six years ago, famous paper on planetary boundaries, and I've illustrated them here because, of course, climate change is, is one of a basket of issues of um, humans being out of balance with the natural world. So climate change is arguably uh, one of the most uh, crucial and one of the ones that is currently um, uh, extending beyond those boundaries. Um, but you can see the rest around the, uh, the side of this circle, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, fresh water withdrawals, biodiversity loss, in particular air pollution and so on. So again, there are a set of interconnected issues, uh, all of which as humans are pushing on the natural system, we're pushing into overshoot. Uh, so there are boundaries that we need to respect. So that was uh, a big step forward. Uh, it, it's a framework in which one can hold kind of adult discussions about how do we how do we make decisions that prevent us from pushing through these boundaries. 
Uh, but in the meantime, um, a, uh, an, an economist, a young economist, Kate Raworth, said, well, you know, there's a whole other set of issues which are more associated with the, uh, with the SDGs, although that wasn't initially her framework. But there's a set of social issues as well, all to do with the basic human needs of uh, food, water, health, energy, housing, and so on. And then other social issues, gender equality, social equality, and so on. And, and, and she said, if we don't organize society in an appropriate way, then then there will be shortfalls in these areas. And, and these these areas are rather nicely characterized by the SDGs. So if you put these two things together, you end up with a diagram which Kate called the, you know, the donut donut economics. Um, that green area uh, she characterized as the safe and just space for humanity. And really what this talk about today is, is how you navigate uh, human beings into the future, maintaining our position in that light green band so that we don't overshoot our, into the natural world and damage it. And at the same time, we don't undershoot in terms of serving the needs of society. So I recommend Donut Economics. Uh, associated books are Tim Jackson's Prosperity Without Growth, and uh, Mariana Mazzucato uh, series of books, but her most recent one is Mission Economy, um, which looks at the role of government in society and basically says neoliberal economics and that uh, free market idea ideology has just got things fundamentally wrong. And until we sort that out, it's going to be very difficult to navigate that green band. Now, it's not just um, uh, preventing climate change from happening. But since climate change is happening and uh, that we've made a commitment to a degree of climate change, which we can't undo now, although we can take action to make it less worse in the future. Um, but rising global temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, etc., uh, will intensify the challenges of global instability, hunger, poverty and, and so on. This is a conclusion that the US Department of Defense came to as long ago as, as 2014 and, and, and many other thinkers, the World Economic Forum, other uh, think tanks, other um, uh, groups have come to the conclusion that climate change feeds back into uh, the world of uh, of human uh, social action. And so it's no surprise that in the 17 uh, SDGs, number 13, climate action, is a crucial one. It's one of the underpinning ones, and it interacts with pretty much all of the other SDGs. As a threat multiplier, it doesn't necessarily cause mass migration, although in some cases it can. Um, but it certainly amplifies the problems that are driving mass migration in, a, in a, uh, an unstable and troubled world. So um, how do we map out then these interactions? We have 17 SDGs, 169 targets, 164 NDCs, 7,000 actions. We have this web of, of decision making. Uh, any one of any one decision of which can have consequences that ripple through the system and can have a perverse or positive impact on all of these other elements. So the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, carried out a study, sustain Sustainable Development Goals Through a Climate Lens, and, and in doing so generated a tool uh, which you can go to on the web which allows you to begin to study at a, at a reasonably useful level um, where one uh, of these um, issues, uh, one of these SDGs or, or NDCs, uh, it interacts with other elements of this um, ecosystem uh, of, of issues and decision making. And it just illustrates a, a screen uh, shot from, from, the, uh, from the web uh, showing these, um, uh, showing the interactions between uh, the various SDGs, and you can play with this um, and see where a particular SDG has its biggest impacts elsewhere or biggest connections. And they they have been through that exercise, and they provide a nice little table where, in this case, we're looking at how climate change interacts with each of the SDGs. Uh, so with poverty. In many countries, NDCs stress the potential co-benefit of climate action for poverty reduction and, and so on. Um, the uh, International Council of Science was closely involved with this and they too have a, a nice report and website. They chose um, uh, Life Below Water, Zero Hunger, 
uh, good health and wealth, well-being and affordable and clean energy for a more detailed study uh, and, and the interaction with uh, uh, climate change. Um, and again, you can work through that report and you can see uh, where those interactions lie. And they developed a scoring table so that if, if two issues uh, uh, formed a positive interaction um, without much effort, uh, then they were uh, scored plus three. Uh, if they reinforced plus two, if they enabled plus one, if they were neutral, zero. And then if there were negative consequences, there was a scale down to minus three. So this is a useful way of, of categorizing those interactions um, that gives you a, a quick sort of thumbnail look at whether you've got um, a positive issue on your hands, in which case you can feel as a decision maker um, fairly happy to pursue uh, your goal. Uh, if uh, you are in the pink or red zone, uh, then that takes a bit more work to figure out what the right balance is. And uh, so how does a decision maker access this? Well, I've said those tools uh, exist on the web. Um, but uh, Nielsen and his colleagues who are very much involved in this uh, SEI and ICSU work uh, published a paper. I'm sure there's a huge literature on this out there, but this particular paper uh, caught my attention um, because they show uh, more than now a, a tool based on, on uh, just on computer modeling. It shows an integrated tool um, that attempts to draw into a single uh, source information based on both modeling and experience. Uh, so modeling in, in the academic uh, world and experience in the policy world that would allow policymakers to engage uh, with all available information to help them uh, in, in deciding what their policy decisions or business decisions should be in order to achieve the right balance uh, between the SDGs and climate change, if indeed they conflict, uh, or indeed to maximize the benefits um, if they are coherent. Now, uh, I've been working, uh, I'm a physical scientist, natural scientist. Uh, my career has been in studying how the Earth system works in one way or another. Um, but I've been back at University College London for uh, nearly 10 years now, and I've been working not with my colleagues in the natural science community, um, but with uh, neuroscientists, psycho psycho psychologists, um, marketeers, narrative specialists, business people. And we've developed a, a map of the domain in which uh, climate change decisions are made. This is specifically addressing climate change. So you have the science community on the left, you have climate action on the right, and you have uh, various intervening uh, actors, uh, officials and experts who advise decision makers in business and policy, the law, arts, culture, the media, civil society, and so on. And we've been interested in all of these interactions, but particularly uh, in the area that I've circled in red, the knowledge exchange between people who know something and people who need to know something to make a decision. And it's often assumed that you can just bring those groups together and magic will occur and, uh, you know, sensible decisions will emerge. And what we know from experience is that that really is not the case. Co-production of policy requires a great deal of effort um, to connect those two communities. Um, and uh, to the extent that those communities don't fully appreciate as often as not how difficult that exchange is uh, and, and how much it pushes the limits of their training and experience to achieve that effectively. So uh, we've developed a methodology that allows us to guide people through that process uh, so that, um, uh, and it's a two-way process because often those making the decisions uh, when working with the climate science community in this case discover that climate science cannot actually deliver them the information that they need. And that may be because it's impossible, it may be too hard, but it may be because since there is such an um, emphasis in climate science on novelty, discovering new things, the existing knowledge has not been applied in a way that those decision makers can benefit from. So it feeds back into the climate science community so that they have to take more action. Um, so this is a tricky area to deal with. Um, and you can see some comments uh, from uh, the, my colleague, the neuroscientist Krista Mayer, on uh, our insights in how to um, uh, lubricate or unblock this process of co-production. 
we're not the only people who realize that the world is a complicated place uh, with a huge number of interactions. Um, this is the World Economic Forum 2021 Global Risks Report, um, in which, again, they um, identify climate action failure as the number one issue that ripples through the entire system uh, that they are looking at. And you can see some of the uh, issues around here, infrastructure breakdown, digital power concentration, involuntary migration, and so on. They look at all of these issues and they say that the, the key keystone issue that needs to be addressed is climate action or climate action failure. And of course, the SDGs are just part of this much broader picture. Um, so I hope that has got people thinking. I'll, I'll stop there and um, I guess uh, hand back uh, to David. Chris, thanks very much for that fascinating and informative insight. Um, yeah, it'd be good if um, we could all turn on cameras, please, especially if you are asking questions, just to really sense um, how um, people are feeling. So I'd like to open the floor now to, to any questions. If you, if you have one, please use the, um, where's it gone? On the reactions button on the bottom, you can put your hand up or wave or something that will inform me who's, who's looking to talk. Um, if you don't get noticed, please mention something in the chat as well, because it now good because of the numbers involved, it goes onto two screens. So I'm gonna juggle the screens. So yeah, any any initial questions? Um, as is uh, Chair's prerogative, I, I may just ask, get things going with the first one. Chris, yeah, there's, there's often a lot of discussion about which one's more important. And I'm as guilty of taking part in this discussion as any. Um, do we need to tackle climate change first or do we need to tackle the SDGs and how do we if we can't do one without the other, how do we best prioritise which ones, which, what we look at? Um, because I think the WEF report, the World Economic Forum report, is is insightful. It, it's mentioned now um, for as long as I can remember since the first one that you know, world businesses who, who are targeted in that report and who are questioned to you know, produce those, that information have, have consistently identified climate change as the biggest threat, even though we've had scares on the digital side, we're now going through the pandemic. Um, climate change still remains that number one concern to world businesses. So how can we best strike the balance between the two? Or is it, not, or is it just not possible? I, I, I'm going to take a, a, a slightly contrarian position on this. Um, about 30 years ago, a very bright individual, Carl Hendrik Robert, who's a um, cancer specialist at the um, Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm, um, came up with the idea, he called it the natural step, and it, it was very in vogue at the time, and it's, it's still around there in one form or another. And he said uh, he'd been thinking about the human relationship with the planet. You know, are we stewards or have we dominion over it? You know, how do we get into uh, what, what, what are the fundamental principles that we need to observe if we need to be in a, in a constructive balance with the natural world? And he said there are four principles, one, and they're very simple. One is uh, if you dig something out of the earth, uh, like fossil fuels or minerals or whatever it is, if you dig it out of the earth and its accumulation in the earth system, atmosphere, ocean, whatever, is deleterious, is damaging both to the natural world and humans, then you should control it at source. You shouldn't try and uh, deal with the, you know, the symptoms. You should deal with it at source. And so, you know, abolishing fossil fuels is something that we've um, all adopted. We might call it net zero, but, but essentially we said we're going to abolish fossil fuels. Um, so that's that's pretty simple. And he said, however much you try and recycle something, it will always leak. So if it is deleterious, you really need to look very carefully about how much you dig out. Second thing is, he said, if you synthesize something in chemistry or biology, and its accumulation in the system is deleterious, like DDT or PCBs or, or CFCs or whatever, uh, then again, you need to control those at source. And, and with the ozone hole, we, we saw humans do exactly that, and with DDT and so on as well. Uh, so those are two pretty straightforward principles. The third one is don't take a chainsaw to the biosphere. You know, it's a kind of metaphor for it is our life support system. It generates the fresh air, the fresh water, you know, everything that we need uh, to, to literally to survive. So it's not a good idea to damage the biosphere. Um, but interestingly, the fourth one um, was pursue human equity. 
ensure that human beings can achieve their um, a, a decent standard of life uh, and fulfill their destiny, so to speak. And as a natural scientist, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, that's an interesting one. Why is that there? And, and he said, essentially, no, that's the most important one, because if you don't get that one right, it's going to be very difficult to get the other ones right, um, because somebody who's hungry is going to chop down that tree or burn that bit of coal or whatever it is. Now, you may say, well, yes, uh, the, the poor of the world um, not only, um, unfortunately, are going to get... Um, uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? I've lost Chris. Yeah, he did mention that this could happen. He said he should join back shortly if there's any problem um, with uh, his signal. He said that sometimes he can have it because he's um, based in the attic, the joys of working from home. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I'm back. back. Okay. It's, uh, I'm sorry about that. It seems to be something my, my Wi-Fi drops out. Anyway, we're, we're back on my uh, phone now. Um, so I don't know where I dropped out, but the, the, the fourth this. issue was uh, human equity. I got to human equity, and yeah. I, okay. And his point was that if you don't if you don't get that one right, you 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 don't stand much chance of getting the ones right. So yes, climate change everybody recognises is the threat multiplier that is really really serious. But you're not going to sort out climate change if you don't sort out these other things. So you you have to do you have to do the SDGs and climate change together. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. There's a question here from um, just in the chat, and I'll call uh, Adam out here. Um, no reference to environmental profession professionals, the natural uh, the natural step anymore, which is a shame, as it feels the most scientific of the SD definitions. I don't know, Adam, if you want to uh, just elaborate on that in, in person. Uh, David, it was just a, a comment rather than than a, than a question, but I think Steve Steve Martin had his hand up a minute ago. Oh, okay, sorry, I missed that, Steve. Okay, Steve, sorry, the hands just flick up for about seven well, seconds. Uh, of, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, well, I ran the Natural Step in the UK for a while uh, with Forum for the Future, ah. and uh, I uh, perfectly agree with Chris Rapley's uh, perceptions. I mean, System Condition 4 was the, if you like, the big elephant in the room, if I can use that expression, <laughs> misappropriation there. But, you know, equity and social equity and justice is very much the mood music it seems to me yeah. and scientists have to come to some kind of agreement and my view is that the professions should be part of that process and yeah. and a big process of interaction and moving this not necessarily from the science per se but big embracing the social dimensions of these sorts of things because we will not bring communities of practice into this unless we engage with them in a much more proactive way and one final point because i don't want to hog it i mean kerry face has just produced in from bristol a wonderful uh report which you probably know chris but beyond business as usual higher education in the area of climate change and it seems to me the higher education sector has a particular role to play here and i'm not convinced that it's doing justice to its particularly social role okay <laughs> Um, if I can just respond to that, there, there I have a colleague who um, uh, uh, there, there is a discussion going on within certainly within University College and I think within the HEIs more generally um, about our role in society and, and whether we are delivering value to society in the way that we should. Um, and I, I've had a bee in my bonnet for a long time now about the um, certainly the, the climate science community. <clears throat> because the, there is this tremendous premium uh, on novelty, discovering new things. That's the way you gain the esteem of your colleagues. That's the way you make yourself feel good. It's what most people get out of bed to achieve as a natural scientist, you know, discover something new, become famous. Um, but both the, the academic reward system and the funding system push people to discovering new stuff. But you can argue that, that we've known enough about climate change for 30 years to kind of move into this other area of, well, what on earth are we going to do about it and how do we galvanize humanity uh, to address it? Um, 
you know, all that's happened in the last 30 years is that the picture has become clearer and clearer and clearer and things have happened more quickly than we might have expected. So I'm not saying that the climate science community isn't doing something useful, um, but academics aren't trained uh, to uh, address the delivery of value to society, whether that's in policy making or communication. I mean, just on the most basic level of how we communicate, confront an academic with an audience and their instinct is to ask themselves, what does this audience need to know? Because as a lecturer, as a teacher, that is their role. You, they, they are faced with students who need to know information in order to pass exams to pursue their careers. Confronted with a policymaker or with a um, or with a public group, you have to ask a different question. What do I want these people to do? And at that point, you you open up a whole box of problems for academics who have an instinctive reluctance to become advocates because they feel that might undermine their impartiality. They're not trained to do that. They're certainly not experts in economics or or social issues. I mean. Uh, social scientists are, but natural scientists are not. Um, and of course, uh, you know, again, uh, Winston Churchill said, I want my scientists on tap, not on top. So they, they uh, have this uh, uh, image of acting as honest brokers who deliver scientific advice on what would happen if certain uh, policy measures were taken, but not interfering with the policy measure. I mean, let's go back to Richie Sunak and the epidemiologists and his decision to open up the restaurants, you know, the epidemiologists were all going, you know, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But they understood that he took a political decision and they understood that that was his um, uh, reason for doing so. So I think there is a whole uh, issue here of the academic world and its relationship with society. Uh, and the dial is beginning to shift over, but it's still far too much into the ivory tower discovery mode and not enough in the out, you know, treading the pavements uh, in the real world mode. But in addition, the other professions, uh, communities of practice have a big role to play as well. And so I'll shut up with one more sentence to say that I have been hugely encouraged by my experiences over the last few years of giving these sort of briefings at how much activity is going on in the world of professions, how many serious people are saying, I'm going to continue to make money but at the same time, I'm going to do it in an ethical and responsible way because I have children or whatever. And there are many success stories of people doing that. OK, Chris, thank you very much. I just yeah, I'd just like to echo that because I'm spent half my career working in academia and then moving from academia into the, you know, what is now the private, the private sector working for a financial investment company. You know, there is a vast amount of knowledge inherent in those professional organisations that relies on academia for information, but also can provide information back to the academic community. And that's, that, that is not in full flow. That, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's barriers in the way there. There's a well, the well documented, but there's a great deal that can be done more in conjunction with the professional community, the private sector and the academics working closely together. Um, just moving on, just looking at a um, question here from Darren. I think this is really relevant here for you, Chris. I don't know if you can read this directly, but how do we make climate change relevant to the public? Darren's experience suggests that it seems still very academic to many, many ordinary people and the impacts that may not occur in their lifetimes are seen as academic, therefore. Yeah. Um, uh, p yes, p people are very hazy about it. Um, uh, when I was at the Science Museum and we were preparing the um, the climate change, uh, climate science gallery atmosphere there, we the, the team there did a lot of focus group work. And even people who had self-selected by going to the Science Museum and therefore were interested in, in science and technology, um, were, uh, it turned out, incredibly hazy uh, about the uh, evidence for and the argumentation of and the, you know, the whole story of climate change. So there's a lot of confusion with the ozone hole. Does the heat leak in and out? Um, so, so even people who kind of accept that this is an issue um, are very hazy about it. And it is helpful uh, to provide just a little bit of reassurance that the, the basis upon which this uh, topic sits is solid and robust. Um, but I think there has been a change, uh, a noticeable change in the last three or four years. Um, and I can characterize it by saying that if I was at a, a gathering 
social gathering five years ago and somebody said to me you know what do you do for a living and I said I'm I'm a climate scientist uh, there would be an immediate uh, air of embarrassment and they would change the subject oh you know the, the the broccoli looks nice doesn't it or something because it was a kind of taboo subject because there was a kind of bad feeling about it you're going to make me feel unhappy and guilty um, and I don't want to know about it and in fact on airplanes I found it very useful if I had a very chatty individual next to me and I needed to get some sleep I would tell them as a climate scientist and that would usually shut them up um, and, and that's changed I find now that people when they discover I'm a climate scientist say oh that's interesting could you explain this to me and I think the difference is that it's become there's a drumbeat of climate change it's this kind of wallpaper now on the media uh, you know print media and uh, and television media you know the very vivid imagery of uh, of Californian wildfires floods you know the collapse of the glacier the other day that wiped out the dam the fact that people are are linking these uh, strong images and stories to climate change has shifted opinion and people are now much more open to having a kind of adult discussion about it um you know what it what what the consequences are and asking the question and what can i do and and that climate action unit that i was talking about at the end of my uh, talk there um is designed to use the understanding of the human mind uh, and um, uh, you know the mind sciences and neuroscience to work with people to help them feel the confidence to find their agency um, and what the neuroscience tells us is that actions drive beliefs it, it, it you know facts don't drive actions other than for a, a very small number of people who do get inspired by and large um, facts just leave people either feeling miserable and shut down or confused and it doesn't drive them to action it's actions that drive beliefs and so we're trying to shift the conversation to the stories of the good news stories of where we can find ways that uh, we can all make a contribution okay chris thank you very much yeah that, yeah i echo that as well in terms of you know my career you know people initially fascinating by what i did and then around copenhagen and climate gate and i was at the climatic research unit from all my academic career embarrassment at times but i do remember sitting next to a couple on the plane going across to the us and they doubted the science so i got my laptop out and gave them an impromptu 40 minute lecture on the subject whether they were desperate to jump off the plane i don't know at the end but just look one final question here um from emma emma bennett um oops, and there are others coming in but we won't be able to address all of these hopefully we'll be able to do this in the course of the, the breakout group Emma asks, what do you consider the increased use of citizen engagement such as climate assemblies would add to the situation? And this will have to be the final question at the moment, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, well, we, we've seen that they are, you know, they're hard work, they're difficult to scale up, you can only kind of do 100 people at a time. Uh, but uh, all of the ones, the Irish ones, the ones that were carried out in the UK have been fantastically successful um, to the extent of engaging people and, um, gaining that momentum unfortunately they have not been connected sufficiently with policy the the Irish one in particular was hugely successful uh, but it was disconnected from the the Irish government and I think you could argue that pretty much the same has been true in the UK so that they're, they're fantastic but only if they connect either to local government uh, or or to the power structure where decisions get made um uh, you know i i live in i live in guildford um uh there's a guildford environmental forum that i was invited to um that was held when the the local council declared a climate emergency but then discovered that it didn't really know what to do about it and so we tried to have uh, a kind of mini citizens engagement with the decision makers um and and i have to say it was a bit disappointing because in the end, the decision makers said their reaction was, well, this is all very well, but but our budgets have been so emasculated, we can hardly afford to collect the rubbish anymore. So, uh, you know, thank you and good night. I'm being a bit unkind. Um, but, it, it, you know, getting... It, let me just give one other example. If you get it wrong, like President Macron did with the um, the fuel price escalator, and if you don't have people on side, then you get the gilet jaune who, if you ask them about climate change, say, well, we, you know, we've got no problem with dealing with climate change, but you're destroying our livelihoods by this particular measure. You know, we, we, we need to have a more adult conversation about it. So engaging the public is great, but it doesn't really work unless you link it with the political system. 
Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I'm just going to extend this a bit. I've been given instructions. I'll just extend this because these questions are fascinating, and um, I'll try and get as many different pe uh, people involved. Richard, Richard Anderson's mentioned. Ho hopefully, Richard, we can cheer you up and hope um, <laughs> you say this by you're, you're in too pessimistic mood. But seven billion people all striving to do them do their best for themselves and their family. How can we ever reach equity? Um, some will always be more equal than others. Oh, this <laughs> is getting very philosophical, but. Um, yeah, I think this the final point of this is, do you think the idea of equity scares policymakers as being too socialist? Yeah, um, good question. <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's a lot wrapped up in that question. So um, this, the, there are sort of levels of, of um, prosperity, aren't there? You know, if, if we all simply took uh, what we needed to survive at a, a perfectly reasonable level um, and shared it equally, um, you, you could probably, <clears throat> you, can, you could cope with 7 billion people on the planet um, if, if we chose to behave ourselves a little bit um, more thoughtfully. Um, I think you're right that there is a movement, isn't there? We, we, we saw the rise of neoliberalism, uh, what, in the 70s and so on, and, and it's been the kind of economic religion and dogma um, that has, uh, has driven the world since then. Um, and of course, the end of the Cold War and communism and socialism and all of that, we're, we're, we're getting into some really interesting but quite complex areas here. Um, but what we've seen is that the, um, uh, the neoliberal system um, does not lift all boats. It lifts the most expensive yachts and leaves the, the rest to sink in the mud. Um, and I think the pendulum, you know, Kate Raworth's uh, work that I mentioned, uh, Mariana Mazzucato's work, um, there's, a, there's a recognition um, with these very extreme polariz political polarizations and ultra simplifications that we're seeing with the world of Trump and the world of Brexit and so on, you know, take back control, the, you know, all, all of this stuff is stirring a reaction where we can see that those, um, those models of achieving equity uh, through the economic and political systems are currently wrong. And that uh, in the end, we've got to fix those if in the long term we're to get into a sustainable balance. Now, when we wrote the play 2071, Duncan Macmillan and I said, you know, should we should we get into that? And and in the end, we decided, well, do you know what? Um, you know, Chris Ratley is a climate scientist. I have some authority in that area. I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. Um, and in any case, boy, if you take on that, you're going to spend so long uh, in, in those battles, you know, climate change will run away in the meantime. So we decided to duck that and focus on the green technology approach, you know, the, and to some extent, uh, human behavior. Um, but in, in the end, that has to be addressed, that, uh, that whole question of, of how we run the modern world through the economic system and the political system to achieve that sustainability. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um... Yeah, one final question, then, and this is oh, oh, just before I move on. Uh, Steve, you mentioned the report, uh, Steve Martin, you mentioned the report earlier on. If you could find the link and share that on the chat, that'd be fantastic. I'd much appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yes. Final question then from Scott, Scott Javi. Um, um, how do we assist the academic community to move away from the knowledge, of, knowledge deficit model of communication? Um, I'll just paraphrase the last bit, really. Steve, uh, yeah. Scott, it's these are our. There are scientists who think that mutual learning is a waste of time, not efficient enough to communicate knowledge. Mm. Yeah, um, I, 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 the, the, the community is shifting. You know, 30 years ago um, in, in the common room, uh, a, a socially acceptable position would be to say <laughs> of somebody who was popularizing science to look sniffily at them and say, you know, well, some people do and other people talk about it. The implication being that people who tried to even popularize science with some kind of second rate intellect. Uh, so there was a kind of arrogance, academic arrogance about um, the role of academe in the real world. Um, that's changed enormously. Uh, you, you, you know, you, we've moved on from that and it's recognized that there's an obligation, not least because we're funded by the taxpayer's purse. Um, but actually, many, many scientists, particularly young scientists, really enjoy engaging uh, with um, the, the general public and with decision makers because it makes them feel uh, of value. Um, it, it, you know, it's not only exciting to discover something, to understand something, but it's more meaningful if you see that it has a net benefit to society. 
So this is changing and, and there is a growing core of, of scientists at the Met Office, you know, in the universities who recognize that the information, you know, who are actually talking to their social science colleagues, been saying this for years, that the information deficit model does not work or, or only works to an extent, can't dismiss it completely, but that we need to engage people on their terms um, in, in ways that, 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 that are meaningful to their daily lives. And so i just give one example. Uh, I was the advisor on uh, the BBC One's Climate Change, The Facts that David Attenborough narrated. And, and that was a wonderful experience and got very engaged in it. But one of the things I absolutely insisted on was that there should be no bloody polar bears um, because, you know, the, the polar bear image, this iconic image of a polar bear standing on a piece of melting ice, which which has become a sort of classic uh, image of climate change, is so unfortunate because most people are never going to go to the, uh, the Arctic or the Antarctic. It's an exotic place. Polar bears aren't going to enter their lives, for goodness sake. So it, 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 uh, that imagery reinforces the idea that climate change is distant, happening somewhere else to other people in the future, nothing to do with me. So engaging people um, in, in their real day-to-day -day lives on day-to-day -day issues is something that the academic community is beginning to understand is crucial if our work is to be of value. And, and, and so it's on the move, not fast enough, but it's happening. And it's particularly happening with the new cohorts of um, younger scientists, younger researchers, who are the kind of social media generation and who are saying, well, why wouldn't we do this? Of course we need to do this. OK, Chris, thanks very much. Look, um, this, this has been a fan fascinating uh, conversation and there are other questions. So apologies for those I haven't been able to cover. We, we are you know, we are limited by time, unfortunately.